First, Dr. Sean Carroll, theoretical physicist here at Caltech, working on theoretical aspects in cosmology, field theory, and gravitation, and particularly works on inflation and the arrow of time, dark matter, dark energy, <clears throat> modified gravity, and the rest. Author of the best-selling book, From Eternity to Here, the, question, the Quest for the Ultimate Theory of Time, which he'll be signing along with the other authors in the break at 4 p.m., and of course the graduate textbooks, Space, Time, and Geometry, the lectures on cosmology for the teaching company. Please welcome Dr. Sean Carroll. Sean, welcome. Here is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is what you get when you point your camera at the sky and just take a picture. If your camera is attached to the Hubble Space Telescope, you see all of these little blobs, each one of which is a galaxy comparable in size to our Milky Way galaxy. So every one of these galaxies has billions of stars of order 100 billion stars. There's 100 billion such galaxies in the universe. None of them are necessary for us to exist here on Earth. If you were just going to make the universe, and you were going to solve fine-tuning problems enough for life to exist, there's no reason to make any of these galaxies. All of the matter, all of the degrees of freedom in those galaxies should be in thermal equilibrium. If you're going to claim that your explanation for fine-tuning is that God made it that way in order for life to exist, you strongly predict that this should be blank, or at least just a chaotic mess. It should not have all of these other galaxies in there. And I know that um, you know, many religious believers would look at a picture like this and go, you know, oh my goodness, the, the glory and stupendousness of God's creation. I look at a picture like this and say, how in the world can you think that the reason for this is to let us be here? We are very tiny compared to a very big universe. Uh, so there's, there's, of course, responses to this kind of argument. People have thought of it. They say, well, maybe you can't make us. Maybe you can't form our solar system without forming all those other galaxies and so forth. This is just false. Everything we know about physics tells us that none of those other galaxies is necessary to explain what we have in our neighborhood here. So you say, well, maybe the reason why you get all those other galaxies of this really lower entropy than you ever needed is because God is sort of um, uh, procedurally thrifty. God does not just make, I mean, so remember, it's God we're talking about. God would have no trouble making just the Milky Way if that's what God chose to do. But you might say, well, God wants to play by his own rules, so God plays by the laws of physics, so God makes use of some physical mechanism for universe creation, which as a byproduct of making conditions that allow for us to exist, also make 100 billion other galaxies. So that is plausible, but you see what's happening. You see that by trying to explain this feature that we would not have predicted, we are pushed to create an essentially physical, naturalistic, scientific explanation. We are removing all of the usefulness from God. We're saying that the reason why the universe looks like that is because there's some physical mechanism that makes it look like that, and that's what God used. But that's a story I can tell without invoking God at all. There's a physical mechanism that made the universe look like this, and then I can just stop. So, the advantage that you might have had in invoking God in the first place has gone away. Yeah, I think two major things here. One is that I think that the confidence that we have in the statement that the universe in which we actually live really is finely tuned is very, very exaggerated uh, in the popular imagination and even among scientists. There's very little what I would call uh, serious work done trying to quantify this. If you were really serious about the statement that the universe in which we live is finely tuned, especially for the existence of intelligent life. What, what does that mean? That means you would write down the space of all possible ways the universe could be. And then you would write down the space of all possible ways the universe could be in which there could be life. And then you would have some measure on both of those spaces, and you would do an integral of one and an integral of the other, and you would divide and get a fraction, and you would say it's a small number. Nobody does anything like that. What does it mean to have a universe that allows for the existence of life? It might mean that the universe has the computational capacity to be a Turing machine, that the universe can do any kind of calculation that you might want to conceivably do. And therefore, there can be parts of the universe that have intelligent information processing systems. If that's your definition, 
It's easy to get a universe that, can, that has the ability to contain intelligent life. Whereas in the actual discussions about fine tuning, people are incredibly parochial and anthropocentric. They, they make statements like, well, you know, if we didn't have exactly the plate tectonics that we had on Earth two billion years ago, then life never would have made it past a certain stage. And that's an incredibly narrow view that if life were any different than exactly the history that we actually had, it wouldn't have existed. The real way that we go from the fundamental laws of physics in our world to you and me and other intelligent beings is not something that we understand even in the actual world. If you change the world to something else, to have the chutzpah to say, then life could not possibly exist, I find difficult to support. So I don't, I'm not sure that there is that much fine tuning, to be honest. This kind of argument that a priori you would not have expected the entropy of the early universe to be so low if God were the explanation is the same kind of argument that has been used to argue against God for millennia now. The probability that if God really exists, the world wouldn't look like that is what we're talking about. This is the problem of evil. If God existed, we wouldn't expect there to be evil. This is the problem of random suffering. Even if you argue that evil is necessary for free will and human choice and so forth, there's no reason to you know, have natural disasters strike down innocent children or anything like that. God could prevent that from happening. It's not what you would expect a priori. Uh, my favorite is the problem of instructions. If I didn't know what the universe were like, but I thought that the universe were designed and created by a caring, omnipotent God who wanted us to do well, the first prediction I would make would be that God would explain himself to us very clearly. As a textbook author who has read his Amazon.com reviews, I would expect God's textbook to be perfectly clear. It might not be easy to follow the instructions, but I would know what the instructions were. It would have been very easy for God in some holy scripture to give us some clues, to say, you know, matter is made of atoms. The universe is billions of years old. Uh, people of different races and sexes and genders and sexual orientation should be treated equally. Governments should derive their power from the consent of the government. A whole bunch of things that God could have told us and chose not to. And that's a prediction that I, I would have made otherwise. I think that if I try to be honest and I try to forget about what the universe is actually like, what I know to be true in the universe, and if I try to ask myself, what would I expect the universe to be like under theism and under naturalism? There's such an enormously large disconnect between what I would expect the universe to be like under theism and what the universe is actually like that I don't think that's a bridgeable gap. I, don't think, I think the universe is big and we are small. I think that there's all sorts of random suffering in the universe. I think that there are completely different religions that people grow up in depending on where they were born and what year they were born in. I think that there's you know, no good evidence for violations of the laws of physics that we would qualify as miracles and so forth. And I think that if theism were true, these would be way different, not like a little bit different. I think it'd be perfectly obvious. How in the world can God exist and care about us and leave us any room for doubt? That just boggles my mind. Imagine your theologian in a world where there wasn't evil or random suffering and where God had given perfectly clear instructions. There were holy scriptures that said, you know, be nice to each other, blah, 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 blah. If you were that theologian, would you take the absence of injustice in the world as evidence against the existence of God? <laughs> I think you would not. I think you would go, well, this is what I would expect God to do. He made a just society for us. If you wouldn't count the absence of injustice as evidence against the existence of God, then you should count the presence of injustice as evidence against the existence of God. Uh, there's a couple of ways to salvage the idea that God would have made the data like this. One is to just erase God's fingerprints everywhere to say, you know what God really likes to do? Act like God doesn't exist. <laughs> God likes to obey the laws of physics. Again, that's possible, but then you're removing the usefulness of God. And the other strategy is vagueness, to deny that we have any reason to expect anything of God, to deny that we can make predictions for what the universe could be like. Uh, so I have a quote here from Terry Eagleton. Uh, he's first trying to say that God is the condition of possibility, the answer to why there's something rather than nothing, very abstract, ethereal sounding concept. But then he likes to say, well, God can have regrets. God is an artist who does things out of love, and therefore you can't predict what God is going to do. The problem is you can't have it both ways. 
You can't both get credit for explaining the finely tuned value of, let's say, the cosmological constant, and yet say that God makes no predictions for other things that we observe about the universe. The multiverse theorists at least try. Here is a, a plot from a paper where people who think about the multiverse are predicting the relic density of dark matter axions in the universe on the basis of the multiverse hypothesis. I don't especially believe this is a reliable prediction in any sense, but at least they are trying. I've never seen a picture like this in a theology journal. No one ever tries to use the God hypothesis. They can try to claim credit for the low vacuum energy that allows us to exist. No one ever tries to calculate the predicted density of axions under the God theory. So that is my conclusion, which is that the, as ontologically extravagant as the multiverse seems to be, God is much more problematic. It's a whole separate category. It's not a kind of physics, a kind of natural process. It's a whole other kind of thing. It is ill-defined, uh, unnecessary as far as I can tell, and seemingly you need to sort of take or leave different predictions that you might make depending on how they fit. Um, it's on the table as a logical possibility. I think as good scientists, we've learned over the last few hundred years that we can do better in explaining the universe. Thank you.